But let me start with prayer and then we'll talk about what we're going to do today. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time. Lord, it's so nice to come together as a body of believers just to celebrate you and what you're doing on the earth in this hour. Yes. Lord, we are aware that uh, there is chaos all around us and confusion. So Lord, I ask that right now you would just settle our minds and focus our eyes on you. Lord, that you would sharpen our spirits to be able to hear what the spirit wants to speak to your church this morning. Lord, use us as iron sharpening iron in our discussion. Lord, help us to go deeper into things of the spirit, even though it seems simple, maybe, and fun sometimes, the conversation, there are deep spiritual principles that help us to overcome our enemy and, and teaches us how to grow in Christ-likeness. So Lord, as we start this series about dealing with difficult people, I ask you, Lord, to make us aware of our own shortcomings. Lord, that we would be humble and open to correction where necessary. And the Lord, that you would use us to bring words of life and hope and encouragement to a hurting world. So we just give you this time. I thank you for everybody that's present, for any needs that are represented here, Lord. We just lift up each home, each family, each marriage, each individual health and medical situation, financial needs. And Lord, you know the challenges that are facing your people. So we ask for protection and provision in the days ahead as we commit to following you. And Lord, I pray, for, especially while there's much going on in the world for our friends in Canada and all that's going on in that country right now, we just pray for protection over people who are standing for justice and truth and that, Lord, your purposes would be accomplished in all the earth in this hour. We just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I could go off in prayer in a few different directions, but I'll just rein it in there. So. <laughs> um, I decided that we'd start this series on how to handle difficult people because I never know who's going to be on this call and I want it to be something practical that we can use, but also things that will help us grow individually and corporately. And this series, the, the bulk of the information I'll be providing you with comes from a book written by Les Parrott called High Maintenance Relationships. It's an old book, and then I will be adding extra information. And today we're gonna to do the introduction to it. And then in each of our subsequent sessions, we'll be talking about specific types of difficult people. It should be kind of interesting because there's probably some of all those difficult people on this call. <laughs> And while we'll learn how to deal with the difficult relationships in our lives, we're also going to examine ourselves because we know the verse where Jesus said, physician, heal yourself. Um, I don't want to take that out of context because he was using that as he was addressing his accusers and the religious crowd um, when he couldn't do miracles in, in his hometown because of doubt and unbelief. But he said to them, you're probably going to ask me, why, physician, why aren't you healing yourself? So we need to take the time to look inside and let the Lord show us the things he wants to show us. But I want to start by opening with a question. How do you folks currently handle the difficult relationships in your life? I want to know all the different strategies you use. And maybe some of you say, I haven't learned any. <laughs> And I'd like to know, but some of you have reached an age where you've probably found a way to deal with some difficult people. Okay, well, let me dive in. And as I mentioned, I'm going to have some little activities for you and some questions as we go along. But we're going to start our series on how to handle difficult people. And these people are everywhere. They're all around us. We all know some people who are difficult in one way or another. They may be people who tend to be argumentative, they're condescending, they're self-righteous, 
They're selfish, sarcastic, or just downright rude. These are the relationships that push our buttons, cause unnecessary trouble and drama, and drain us of our time and energy. We all have to deal with these types of people, whether it's in our home, at work, in our faith community, our schools, or our communities. So how are the normal people like you and me supposed to deal with these people, these difficult people? And more importantly, how does God want us to respond to them? And as usual, we're gonna to need to go to the Bible and see what the scriptures have to say to discover the answer. So over the years, I have talked to a lot of people and I've noticed that there are many people in their middle age, anywhere, let's say beginning at age 40, it's getting younger all the time, uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s, who have no strong friendships and relationships. And I often talk to them about the need to work on relationships and develop relationships. I never forget one man who came to me, professional man, very successful in his career, his chosen profession. And he came from a very dysfunctional background, a lot of trauma and dysfunction in the family of origin. And so he'd learned to be a lone ranger and to take care of himself in a lot of ways. And he came to me after I think turning the age of 50 or being in his late fifties and saying, you know, I've lived my whole life alone. And up until this point, it's worked for me. But as I look at getting older, I'm wondering if I've made a wrong choice and if I should be involving people more in my life. What do you think, Nancy? <laughs> And I just said, everything's a choice. Uh, you can continue to do what you've been doing, knowing that as you age and your needs increase, you will be alone. Or you can do the hard work to develop healthy relationships. And at this point in your life, that's going to take a lot of energy. You've never done it. You're starting from scratch. You're gonna to have to learn a new set of skills. And basically, we, after our time talking, he said, I think I'm good with what I'm doing. I'm at peace with that. And I realize that things may get difficult in the future, but I'm a smart and capable person and I will come up with a solution when that time comes. And I said, okay. But part of it is people need to sit down and examine their lives, the state of their relationships and think about the days ahead. And then you make a choice and you own your choice because we all have that will. Over the years, probably none of us have spent a lot of time thinking about the need to work on relationships. There are many who believe that because we're family, you owe me a relationship. There's an expectation that because of blood relationship or because we go to the same church, you're a Christian, so you owe me a relationship. You owe me friendship, you owe me love, you owe me acceptance. And that's a very faulty way of thinking. I can love you and have compassion for you and have no relationship with you. I don't owe you a relationship or intimacy. I have a responsibility to have the love of Christ for you and, and have compassion and to help you if God put you in my path. So we're talking about the fact that having relationships requires some investment of energy. It takes a lot of intentionality and it's going to take a lot of emotional work to have healthy relationships with other people. This includes our spouse, our kids, our parents, our extended family, and then out beyond. This goes to the core of our relationships. You have to work very, very hard. I tell people when they come to me for marriage counseling or parenting issues, Marriage is probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, followed closely by raising my children. It took a lot of intentional work to be able to have healthy relationships at this point in life. It also took effort on their part, because as Pauline mentioned, you have to have both parties invested if you're going to have a healthy relationship and mature relationship. And the fact is there are just some people who are more difficult to get along with. And sometimes there are people who are just impossible to get along with. 
And unless you and I are ready to completely disconnect from society and live as hermits and be isolated, we aren't going to be able to avoid running into these people or interacting with them. We all have that natural tendency to want to avoid unpleasant people and difficult relationships. That's why one of the strategies, I think it was Pauline that mentioned, I just avoid them. But what are we supposed to do when these impossible people and these difficult relationships live in the same house as us or work with us or are in our faith community? What do we do then? Well, about 30 years ago, there was a survey done that asked people what makes them the most happy. And the answer was very surprising because it wasn't professional success. It wasn't status, image, or money. The consistent answer that people gave was having close relationships with other people. That is what determines someone's level of contentment and happiness. But if that's what the majority of people want, then why do we have such a hard time developing and maintaining healthy relationships? We all, especially when we get in Christian community uh, and we want to be friends with this person or that person, but we hear a lot about cliques. I'm here to tell you cliques are in every segment of society. And it's just that some people have history together that you don't share at the same level or they have temperaments that are more compatible. But there are some circles that I'm just not going to be invited into. And like I said, I used to feel rejected and left out. But once the Holy Spirit said to me, Nancy, stop knocking on doors that are closed to you. And once he said that, it was just very simple. There's a lot of other doors open. Go look for those. Stop trying to gain entrance through this door. God has a way of developing relationships where we least expect it if we are paying attention. And too often, like I said, we're trying to knock on doors that are closed to us and we want to be friends with this person or that group. When really God's saying, if you would just be quiet for a minute and watch where I'm aligning you and where I want you to develop relationships, instead of thinking I need to be with this group, I need to be with this person. Most of us have people in our lives that we get along well with. And as I'm talking, I'd like you to think about names or faces or specific people. All of us have people that we get along well with. These relationships don't require much effort or work on our part. They're just easy to be with. These are called our low maintenance relationships. They're comfortable and easy. And hopefully all of us have a few of these people in our lives. On the other hand, most of us also have some relationships that aren't so easy. These are the people who complain, gossip, attack you, put you down, play the victim. They're jealous, angry, or bitter. And in many cases, these are people that we would prefer to just not be around. These would be considered our high maintenance relationships or our difficult people. These are relationships that are not mutually beneficial. And one of you just mentioned that they're not mutual. They're not meeting you halfway. Healthy relationships are mutually beneficial. They benefit each party. But these unhealthy, difficult relationships tend to be one-sided. These are the folks that drain our energy, take our time, and waste our resources. They seem to make our life a little harder than it needs to be. But before we decide to write these people off or cut them out of our lives, we may need to consider what scripture has to say about dealing with them. In Romans 12, 18, it tells us that as much as it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Even the most difficult high maintenance relationships in your life can be improved. And the effort you put into addressing them will help you grow emotionally healthier and spiritually stronger. You working on your relationships is going to cause growth in you, especially if you're doing it the way God intended. The Holy Spirit can have his way in you. You're going to feel more fulfilled. You'll find that you have a better attitude and you will feel less controlled by other people. The fact is taking time to address these difficult relationships is going to make your life easier in the long run. So let's take a minute to assess your own life. And I'd like you to number your paper 
that you have, those of you who are taking notes, from one to 16, and don't panic when I say 16, I'm gonna ask you some yes or no questions. I wanna assess and take a look at how much your relationships are impacting your spiritual health and your emotional health. I'm gonna ask you 16 questions and I would just like you to write down yes or no as I read these questions. And as you answer them, if anybody's face or name pops into your head, write that name down next to the question. I'm not gonna ask you about the names, but it's important that you know. Okay, number one, do you tend to feel anxious when a particular person has called or texted and left you a message asking you to call them or get back to them? Does that cause you anxiety or stress? Yes or no? Number two, have you recently been dealing with a person who drains you of your energy and joy? Have you recently been dealing with a person who drains you of your energy and joy? Number three, do you sometimes dread having to see or talk to a particular person at home, at work, or in a social setting? Are there folks that you dread seeing? Number four, do you have relationships with someone who regularly takes more from you than they give in return? This would be the one-sided relationship I was talking about. They're takers, whether it's emotionally, financially, uh, materially, they take more than they give. Number five, do you find yourself second guessing yourself or what you've said and what you did after you interact with a person? This would basically be, do you walk on eggshells around this person or feel like, oh, I probably should have said it this way. Number six, do you find yourself explaining, apologizing, or defending yourself or becoming more self-critical after interacting with a particular person? Is your productivity and creativity blocked when you have to work with a specific person or interact with a specific person? Number eight, do you find that you're more confused or your focus is distracted and you don't have as much mental clarity as a result of dealing with any specific person that they impact your mental clarity, cause confusion and distract you? Number nine, do you find, and think about this one because people would immediately say, no, I'm guessing, but just think about this for a minute. Do you ever find that you end up talking to yourself, chewing your nails, emotionally eating or shopping or doing some other addictive behavior in an attempt to calm your emotions after you've been with a particular person? We can all think of times where you're really stressed or drained and then you run to go to have something to eat or you go shopping or whatever it is. Number 10, do you ever find yourself having imaginary conversations with this person or mental arguments in which you're defending yourself or you're telling them what you think or you're trying to explain the situation to them? Are you having imaginary conversations? Number 11, do you find that you're having more physical ailments such as colds, stomach problems, digestive issues, or muscle tension anytime you have to interact with a specific person? Number 12, do you feel resentful or angry toward a particular person because of the way they treat you or speak to you? Number 13, do you wonder why a particular person consistently criticizes you, ignores you, dismisses you, disrespects or mocks you while rarely acknowledging you when you do well? They're just the people who put us down all the time or they're sarcastic. Number 14, 
Have you thought about quitting some activity or staying away from some activity or cutting off your relationship with a person because they're just so difficult to be around? Are you avoiding places and people because of your high maintenance relationship? Number 15, have you noticed that you tend to be more irritable, frustrated, or impatient with other people after you've interacted with a difficult person? When you have interactions with this particular person, do you find that you're sharper in your tone, more irritable, and less patient with others? And the last one, number 16, does it cause feelings of discouragement that this relationship continues to drain you of your energy, despite all your efforts to communicate with them and improve the relationship? Of those 16 questions, I'd like you to count up, circle your yes answers and count them, please. And if you all know how to use the chat, I'd like to know how many of you had 10 or more yes answers. How many of you had 10 or more yes answers? Just type in the chat, me, 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 me. Um, I can tell you, I do. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Seven yeses out of 13 people. This is a pretty common, um, pretty common situation for most people. They have difficult people in their lives. And while there's, there might be some people who can annoy everyone, there are just some people in the world that are annoying to everybody they meet. But actually those people are few and far between and they're quite rare because most people have somebody that they can get along with just fine. And then there are others that they can't stand to be around. Remember that some people's temperaments are just more compatible than others, their styles, their interests. Almost every one of us has people who enjoy being around us. So we can't just say that somebody's completely annoying and a loser and very difficult because chances are they have people that enjoy them completely. I don't know if you've ever had conversations where you say, I get so irritated being around that person and someone else speaks up and go, I don't have a problem with them at all. I don't know what your problem is. It's because different temperaments People respond differently, different expectations, different behaviors and thought processes. So for a minute, I'd just like you to think about the fact that you might be somebody's difficult person. Have you ever considered that? That there may be people that consider you very difficult to be in a relationship with. There may be people that find it very hard to spend time with you and it takes a lot of energy. Do you know when people are expending a lot of energy to be in your presence? Does that thought bother you? We're all familiar with the scripture passage in Matthew 7, three through five, when Jesus is speaking and he says, why are you looking at that speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and you're not paying any attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to that person, here, let me get that speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in yours? You hypocrite, first take that plank out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly enough to remove the speck from your brother's eye. What is there about you that somebody else might find frustrating or annoying? Do you know? I know about me, because <laughs> I get lots of feedback over the years. And I've spent a lot of years trying to be very aware of what there is about me that other people find annoying. And at the end of the day, I can only fix so much of that. 
I do my best to not be annoying. And I expect other people I'm in a relationship with to have some measure of grace with me and patience like I do with them. It's very important that we become self-aware of how we impact other people and to also recognize our behaviors and attitudes that tend to annoy and frustrate people. We also need to be aware what are the kinds of behaviors and attitudes in other people that tend to frustrate us the most. Maybe it's somebody who doesn't follow through on their word. Maybe it's somebody who chews with their mouth open. Maybe it's somebody who's always negative. You need to know what your buttons are that really annoy you about other people and then own that because it means I'm aware that I'm a little sensitive around this issue. And have you ever heard the old saying, the things that annoy us about other people are often traits that we have ourselves? When I get annoyed with somebody, I very often stop and say, do I do that? And when I was in my, what I call my spiritual boot camp with the Holy Spirit years ago, I used to ask that to the Lord a lot. Do I do that? He'd say, yes, <laughs> you do. And it was really annoying and I didn't like it in other people, but I needed to stop doing it myself. Often the things that annoy you about others are traits that you have. Not always, but sometimes. If we're to make the most of our most irritating relationships, it will be because we're committed to becoming the people that God's called us to be. Jesus asks a very pointed question in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, 46 through 48, he says, if you love those who love you, what reward are you going to get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you only greet your own people, what are you doing more than them? Don't even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. And that's not calling us to perfectionism but in the way we conduct our relationships. It's really easy to be kind and loving to the people who are like us. That's really easy, but the world does that. Unbelievers do that, pagans do that. What sets us apart? And we know scripture tells us that you'll know believers by their love. That's what the difference is supposed to be. To be, become more Christ-like means that we're choosing the high road and we're choosing to love even the most unlovable people, the most difficult people. It means that we're making a choice to grow in our patient, patience, our compassion, our honesty, and our willingness to extend grace and our willingness to forgive people. So to grow in healthy relationships, we need to grow in four areas. So if you wanna number your paper one through four, I'll give them to you. First, we need to grow in humility. When we're dealing with difficult people in our lives, it can sometimes be tempting to follow their lead and to meet them where they're at, especially for those of us who tend to be beavers or lions in your temperament. These are the people that wanna have the last word. They're very articulate. They're very knowledgeable. They're very competitive. And so when we meet somebody that comes up against us, it would be very easy to crush them and say, okay, let's have at it. And I'll just meet you where you're at. And I'll talk to you like you're talking to me. That is a mistake. That is not what God calls us to do. When we do that, we're operating in pride and we're priding ourselves on having the last word, being right, winning an argument or proving that we can best them or we're more clever than them. But this is nothing more than operating in pride and pride allows no room for humility. You cannot be operating in pride and be humble. It's important to remember the warning of the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Before you come across as arrogant and obnoxious to somebody else, you really need to Look at, your, look at yourself with sober judgment, he says. Look at yourself according to God's word. We need to approach difficult people in our lives with meekness and humility. Because the fact is, there's going to be no hope of changing that relationship without humility. 
the first step on the road to humility is to acknowledge that you and I are also difficult people and that others have had to extend grace and patience to us in order to stay in a relationship with us. We must always remember that God gives grace to the humble. Secondly, what we're going to need is determination. Too often when we're faced with difficult people and difficult relationships, we just want to give up and run away. And here I'm speaking to those who have otter and golden retriever tendencies because these people hate conflict of any kind. But it can also apply to all of the temperaments. It's not just those two. But running away and avoiding them really solves nothing. If a relationship is ever going to improve, we must have determination, especially in times of frustration and conflict. The fact is, in order to have healthy relationships, you're going to need to be able to engage in conflict. You are going to have to have hard and difficult conversations with people if you want to have a healthy relationship with them. You cannot surround yourself with yes men and think that you're having healthy relationships. I often ask people, who confronts you? Who challenges you? Who rebukes you? Who speaks truth to you? And who do you actually listen to and heed their counsel? And I am amazed how many people say nobody. That's a problem, folks. That accountability and those truth tellers in my life are my safety and my protection. And they help keep me on track. The Holy Spirit first, and then my godly counsel, my circle of godly counsel. The Bible gives us many examples of people who ran away when they were faced with conflict. When Christ was agonizing in the Garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion, his disciples couldn't stay awake. And when Judas and the soldiers arrived to arrest Jesus, a conflict and a battle ensued, and the disciples all deserted him and ran away. Adam and Eve in the Garden ran away. Moses tried to run from his call. David, Elijah, and Peter, they all tried to avoid conflict and to run away from difficult relationships. All of these examples demonstrate a lack of determination when it comes to working with difficult people. I guess this is why when people reject me, abandon me, betray me, why it bothers me so much, because I don't do that in relationships. I believe that relationships are worth fighting for, even when you have to say difficult things and when you have to hear difficult things. I just don't give up on people unless God has told me to release them and unless there's a long-standing pattern of behavior that shows no signs of improving. Once I have exhausted every strategy that God has given me, I can still love the person, but there will be no relationship. There is no fellowship um, I don't wish them ill will, but there comes a time of release. And that's biblical. We'll talk at some point about when is the appropriate time to end relationships, because that is a biblical principle. The truth is many difficult relationships are improved because one person was determined to make it better. It will take two people to be invested, because remember, healthy relationships are mutually beneficial. It means both people are bringing something to the table. And they're being honest and genuine and transparent. But one person can save it by not giving up and doing everything they can before God. And that's what we're going for at the end of the day when we stand before Christ. Can we look at him and say, I did everything you asked me to do to keep this relationship. And at the end of the day, it wasn't enough. And if you have godly counsel around you, they'll let you know if you say, I think I'm being released from this. That's where the accountability piece is so important. There is a time to just let go because you're just beating a dead horse. So I've said to people, you need to put that final nail in the coffin. This relationship has been dead for a long time. You can't resuscitate something that gave up the ghost. But the key is knowing when that is. The, the third thing you'll need is acceptance. 
too often we like to just diagnose people, judge them and label their behaviors when they're being difficult or hard to be around. We seem to have a hard time just accepting people the way they are. We want people to change their personality for us. And so we spend a lot of time trying to educate them about why this is troublesome to us and we need them to change and we need them to be, give us this and give us that. And when we're with them, this is what we expect from them. We tend to come into relationships with a lot of expectations about what this person owes us or what we want from them. And it's really hard to drop our expectations, but that's where you're gonna find freedom comes. When you stop expecting from people what you want, the grace and the acceptance that God has shown to you and me is the same acceptance we must show to the people we encounter, including the difficult ones. Philippians 2.4 tells us that each of us should look not only to our own interests, but also the interests of others. When we try to, uh, or when we attempt to accept people as they are, it reduces my disappointment in the relationship and it stops me from expecting them to act differently. Now, the author uses this example, and I'm using it because this is, this is me, the example he gives. <laughs> and I don't know that I agree with his conclusion. So I'm going to ask you your thoughts afterwards. And you don't have to agree with me. So I give you freedom to say whatever you want to say. He's saying, drop your expectations of other people so we don't get disappointed in them. And my question is, should we have expectations of the people we're in relationship with? <clears throat> and he uses this example. I have a friend who is always late. He could put Nancy's name in there. <laughs> and it used to make me very angry with him. But rather than getting upset and trying to lecture him or change him or correct him, I have learned to practice acceptance by bringing along a book when I'm supposed to meet him. Accepting him and his irritating behavior lessens my frustration and it takes the pressure out of my relationship. What do you think? Do you think we need to accept? He's using lateness as an example. You can plug any issue in there that irritates you with your relationships. Do you think we need to learn to accept irritating behavior from others? that causes us frustration and annoyance. I do agree that different levels of relationship, I will forgive much more depending on the relationship. And so there are times that I've had people say to me, why are you tolerating that? You would not tolerate someone speaking, someone else speaking to you like that. And I said, because of the relationship, I'm I'm going to try a little harder. Um, mm -hmm. But even then, there comes a time where patterns, unhealthy, sinful patterns of behavior need to change or the relationship has to end, in my opinion. The fourth attribute we're going to need is hope. Hope is what is desperately missing in many people's lives today, in this hour, in this season. Once we've recognized our own shortcomings, and once we've determined to accept people as they are without trying to change them, then we can have hope about the future and about our relationships. Hope is a very powerful force in healing and nurturing every relationship. If people think they're never gonna be able to have a relationship with you, or you feel like this is a hopeless situation, then chances are the relationship isn't ever going to get better. But if you have hope and believe that things can change, miracles can happen. St. Augustine, I love this quote, St. Augustine defined hope, and I'll read it twice here so you get it. He defined hope as having two beautiful daughters, and their names were anger and courage. Anger at the way things are currently, and courage to see that they don't remain this way forever. Hope says I'm angry at this situation, but I have the courage to work to make it better so it doesn't stay this way. Without hope, our high maintenance relationships will be a living hell. 
we'll feel like there's no escape. We have to tolerate it. Don't tell yourself that irritating people in your life are always going to be irritating. Keep your hope alive. People do change. Situations change. People grow, mature, and gain self-awareness. God gave you grace while you've been growing and changing. We need to do the same for the difficult people in our lives. Don't let the difficult relationships in your life cause you to stumble in your quest for holiness and holy living. Those difficult relationships are often what's going to form and shape you on your journey to holiness. Hebrews 10.23 exhorts us and says that we are to hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For the one who is promised is faithful. Don't give up on your hope, what God's going to do for you and what he can do in others. In this book of Les Parrott's High Maintenance Relationship, he identified 20 specific high maintenance relationship styles. He surveyed 100 people and they consistently indicated that out of these 20 styles, 15 kept showing up. And of the, of the 15, there were five that were mentioned as the most common problems in people's lives as being their most difficult and high maintenance relationships. So I'm going to ask you to number your paper from one to 15 again. And I'm going to share with you the 15 groups of high maintenance relationships. And I'm going, I'm going to give you a name for each of them. You can just jot the name down. And I'll give you a little brief description of what they're like. And as I read them, and you jot the name of the style down, um, I would like you to just make a note on your paper if anybody comes to your mind that falls into this style. Okay. So let's start with number one. Number one is the critic. The critic. These are the people who constantly complain and are always giving you unwanted, unsolicited advice about what you should do, what you should have done, how it should be. The critic. Number two is the martyr. The person who always acts like a victim. They're filled with self-pity and feelings of rejection. They're always looking to be rejected. You can say anything and they turn it into you've rejected them and their feelings are hurt. That's the martyr. Number three, the wet blanket. This is the person who is usually pessimistic all the time and automatically sees the negative in everything and everybody. The wet blanket. Number four, the steamroller. These folks are blindly insensitive to the needs and the emotions of others. They just plow over people. They're kind of abrasive. They don't really care. They don't see. They might be lacking discerning and emotional intelligence. That's the steamroller. Number five is the gossip. These are the people who spread rumors and share confidential information. Number six is the control freak. They just can't let things go or they can't let people be. They try to control situations and people. Number seven is the backstabber. These folks are two-faced and unable to be trusted. Number eight is the cold shoulder. These would be your passive aggressive folks who tend to carry a lot of, they're offended and bitter and they will just freeze you out or avoid you if they're upset with you. They don't talk to you. Number nine 
is the green-eyed monster. These are the people who are filled with jealousy and envy. And they suffer from FOMO a lot. And if for some reason you don't know what FOMO is, that's F-O-M-O, -O, and it stands for fear of missing out. They want to be part of everything. And they're upset if they weren't invited to this or included in that. Jealousy and envy. Number 10 is the volcano. These are the ticking time bombs that explode with anger at other people. Number 11 is the sponge. These are the constantly needy, what we call the emotional bloodsuckers or vampires <laughs> who draw and pull from other people while giving nothing in return. They're just needy, needy, needy. And they're, they're like a golden retriever sitting in front of you. And I'm talking about the animal, not the temperament. A golden retriever sitting in front of you that's going, pat me, pat me, tell me you love me, look at me, pay attention to me. Number 12 is the competitor. These people like to be on top. They like to win. They're all of their focus on one upmanship. They keep track of tit for tat and who's on top and who owes me something and who's the next move is. I did this for you. Now it's your turn to reach out. I invited you out to lunch last time. So I'm waiting for you to invite me. These are the competitors. Number 13 is the workhorse. These are the people that are just pushing themselves all the time. Got to get things done. There's much to do. Let's get at it. Come on, folks. They push themselves and they push everybody and they're never satisfied because it's always on to the next thing, on to the next thing. Number 14 is the flirt. These are people who talk in suggestive innuendos. They make inappropriate comments bordering on harassment. And when you address them about their innuendo or suggestive comment, they'll say, what are you talking about? That's not what I meant. The flirt. And number 15 is the chameleon. The chameleon. These are the people pleasers who just want everybody to like them. They don't want any problems and they avoid conflict at all costs. Now, did you all get those or do I need to fill in any spots for anybody before I ask you the next step? What I'd like you to do is choose your top five high maintenance relationships or your most difficult relationships. Which of these 15, which five of these 15 are the most difficult for you to put up with and tolerate? And I would like you to, once you've picked those top five, rank order them from number one to five with one being the one that irritates you the most. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Well, when Dr. Parrott did the survey and he asked the people in the survey to rank order them from number one through five, these were the ones that came up. This is the order that came up in the top five in his survey. Very similar to what you folks have just put. The number one most common annoying style was the critic. Followed by the martyr then the wet blanket, the steamroller, and the gossip. Those were the top five in his research. Did any of you think of names when I was going through this? Were there names that popped into your mind? <laughs> these are the things, these are the prayer points you want to focus on and ask the Lord, you know, how you, we're going to learn how to respond to them, but What's God trying to do in you through this relationship? This series that we're going to do is not so much about how to change people. 
but rather it's how we can change the way we interact with them. Romans 15 1 tells us that we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. This is a series that will help you to learn skills that will build better relationships and help you establish healthy boundaries with the difficult people in your life. Learning to grow healthy relationships is an exercise in growing in Christ-likeness. And it doesn't matter who the relationship is with. Again, if it's your children, your parents, your spouse, even elderly, I don't care how old they are, we don't need to tolerate inappropriate behavior. Senility is not an excuse to tolerate abuse. We have more understanding maybe, patience and compassion, but you still have to have boundaries. You can still be loving toward difficult people while not allowing them to abuse you, control your time, or disrupt your emotions. How did Jesus respond to the difficult people around him? If you don't log on to any other series besides today, I'm going to give you the five things that Jesus did to handle difficult people. And if you implement these strategies, you'll have everything you need. Jesus never displayed an attitude of superiority, impatience, or arrogance. He wasn't self-righteous and pious. What he did was he responded with authority under control. We talked last year about what does it mean to stand in our authority in Christ? You need to learn how to stand in your authority in Christ, but be controlled in that. And these are the five strategies, the way he demonstrated his authority. Number one, he often used silence. He just let their words hang in the air and let their words speak for themselves. This is hard to do, especially if you're a person who's articulate and likes a good debate. But sometimes I have found the most powerful thing to do is to say nothing and let somebody's words just drop in the room. And it causes, it, it does more than anything I could have said. In John 8, 6, Jesus' accusers were trying to trap him in order to have a basis for accusing him. That's when they said it was the woman at the well. And they were saying, hey, she sinned. And she's in adultery. And she should be stoned and killed. And what did Jesus do? He didn't say anything. He bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. Well, I take that back. He did say something. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Um, that would be the second thing he did. He would point people to scripture. That was the second strategy Jesus would use when dealing with difficult people. In Mark 10, two to three, again, the Pharisees were coming and testing him and said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus said, what did Moses command you? Pointed them back to the scriptures. Which led to the third strategy he used often. And this is one I prefer to use, is easier for me than being silent, <laughs> is he asked a lot of questions. In Mark 11, 28 to 29, and there's all kinds of scriptures that demonstrate these strategies. I'm just picking out one here and there. Mark 11, 28 to 29, Jesus again is asked by his accusers, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the authority to do this? And Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Number four, Jesus told a lot of stories. He used parables. Sometimes I've had people get irritated with me because they say, Nancy, you tell too many stories. Sometimes I'm telling stories so I don't reach over there and choke you or slap you. <laughs> I'm trying to make a point without being accusatory and direct. Sent me a meme this morning that made me laugh and I'm probably gonna use it later. And she said, my, it says, my problem is I want to follow Jesus and slap people too. 
I can relate to that. Sometimes I just want to say what I want to say, but God says, tell a story, Nancy, put in an example in, in Luke 7, 40 to 42, Jesus answered him and said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? We see Jesus using a story and asking a question. I remember having to talk to a family member once about something they had done that was very unfair and very hurtful to a number of people in the family. They didn't get it. They didn't understand what the problem was. And I remember saying to them, imagine I did this. And I told a story and created a scenario and gave a brief example. I said, what would that say to you? And they were quickly able to get the gist of it. Sometimes that's the only way we can reach people is to engage their critical thinking skills. And number five, what Jesus used was rebuke, a word of rebuke and correction. Now, where did Jesus usually use his words of rebuke and correction? Against the religious leaders, the religious crowd. They thought they knew it. They thought they had it figured out. In John 8, 47, it says, whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. That's just a word of correction. I mean, go read the seven woes in Matthew. You hypocrites, you whitewashed sepulchers, you brood of vipers. He was pretty strong with his words at times. To the disciples, oh, you have little faith. How much longer do I need to put up with this? There is a time for a word of rebuke and correction. It is not supposed to be just grace and compassion and forgiving all the time. If every time I meet you, you insult me, I'm only going to extend grace so many times before I'm going to maybe ask you a question why you're doing that. And if it continues, there's going to be a word of rebuke and correction and a boundary set that if this continues, I'm not going to be able to be around you. There is a time and a place for that. Some of us are too quick with words of rebuke and correction, and we need to tone it down and learn some restraint. And others need to open their mouths and don't hide cowardice under the guise of grace. Too often, grace is used as an excuse for cowardice in the church. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was quite clear about dealing with difficult people in love and humility. In Luke, 6 27 to 31 he says but to you who are listening i say love your enemies do good to those who hate you bless those who curse you pray for those who mistreat you if someone slaps you on the cheek turn them turn to them the other one also if someone takes your coat give them your shirt give to everyone who asks you and if anyone takes what belongs to you do not demand it back do to others as you would have them do to you. There are some times that it's not worth addressing something. Again, I believe you have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in all things related to relationships, because I find too many people just keep thinking God wants them to forgive and forgive and to tolerate and to put up with inappropriate behavior, because that's a doctrine they've been taught without knowing the fullness of the scriptures, that there is a time to confront to rebuke and to end relationships, but you need to know when that is. We need to know the process for approaching people in difficult relationships. Dealing with difficult people is unavoidable, and, but we don't have to avoid them. We need to recognize though, that we are powerless to change anybody else. If you could for just a minute, think about three people in your life that you would most like to change. And then think about the ways you've tried to do that over the years. Were you ever successful in changing anybody? If you say yes, you'd be the first person that's ever said yes to me. The fact is we can't change anybody. 
We can educate, we can provoke, we can correct, we can rebuke, we can cry, we can plead, we can beg, we can get angry, we can pray for them. But at the end of the day, they have a will and they have a choice. We have no power to change anyone. It's our responsibility to simply express our thoughts and feelings honestly to them. And if you think right now, how many relationships do you have where you can't be honest because the person would cut you off and not want anything to do with you? If that's the case, that's not a healthy relationship. That's one where you're being held hostage emotionally by someone. It's manipulative and it's not of God. If you have to walk on eggshells around anybody and pick and choose your words carefully all the time, that's not a healthy relationship. We need to be able to express ourselves honestly with people. We need to be able to establish appropriate boundaries and trust that they're going to respect them. We need to learn how to skillfully manage people's behaviors when they're in our presence. When people, you've heard this quote, I think it was Maya Angelou, I've said it many times. When people show you who they are, believe them. And if you have shown me repeatedly that you aren't going to respect my boundaries, then I'm going to limit my time with you. If you have shown me repeatedly that you're going to be late when I invite you to dinner, well, I'm going to, maybe I, I will let you know I'm going to give you a 10 minute grace period and then I'm going to order my dinner. So don't be offended when you show up late and want to know why I couldn't wait for you. The thing is, you need to be able to express your boundaries in a relationship. And do it without anger. I tell people, if you're late, I understand that. I'm late a lot. I don't ever want anybody to wait for me. If I'm late, you go do what you need to do. I don't want you sitting there stewing and getting mad and saying I ruined your evening. Go do what you need to do. And likewise, I'm going to do the same. I'll give you a grace period. Well, I have the same situation. And to be honest, anybody who's been married any length of time probably has behaviors in their spouse that are exceedingly annoying and we don't want to tolerate. Uh, again, you have to look at what your options are and the cost and the consequences. How much of a violation is that behavior or attitude to your core principles and beliefs? What can you live with? What can't you? Uh, because our relationship with our spouse is quite a bit different than our relationships with anybody else. That's a covenant relationship before the Lord. Uh, there are a lot of consequences because sometimes there are behaviors that we just cannot no longer tolerate and divorce has to happen. Um, but if you're saying divorce is not an option for me, then we learn how to live with it and protect ourselves emotionally and spiritually when those behaviors continue. Um, so some relationships we cannot disentangle from or we cannot manage. So uh, my husband would say, I have behaviors that drive him nuts. And I would say he has behaviors that drive me nuts. And I have learned how to manage my response to those behaviors because those behaviors aren't going away. I sometimes I have to remove myself or I have to have so many hours of solitude to get in a place where that doesn't disrupt me the rest of the day. You just ask the Lord what you can do short of divorce to be able to live in the situation. But when I say skillfully managing, there is an art to that. And there are times we need to use it. I think our spouses are different because they live in our home. And unless we're going to divorce them, we can't really do much about their behaviors. But everybody else, I can manage their behaviors. I learned how to manage my children's behaviors to a large extent. I couldn't manage it outside of my site and outside of my home. Um, but for example, I rarely have people in my home anymore. I used to have people in my home all the time. But now if I'm going to spend time with people, it's going to be in a restaurant or in the office. Or if I have people in my home, there's going to be an arrival time set and a departure time set. And I do that because there have been so many people over the years that have disrespected boundaries and they will just stay forever and you're trapped. And I hate feeling trapped. They have no sense of decorum of knowing when to leave. 
And so I manage behaviors by not letting them in my home. And if they want to get together with me, we'll do it outside of my home. So I can get up and leave when I want to leave. Um, that's one way I manage behaviors. And I do it across the board. So if I say to one of you, let's go have lunch, don't think it's because I'm trying to manage your behavior. Um, I do it with everybody because I've just learned it's important to me. My house is my only place I can go and have privacy. It's my sanctuary. It's my place where I can clear my mind and be quiet. And I can't do that when other people are there because of my level of discernment and things that are going on and people are needy. Um, I'm not a visitor. I hate visiting. I will never go sit in a living room and watch TV with somebody or chitty chat. I can't think of nothing worse that would make my skin crawl. But there are other people that enjoy that. Those, that's what we talk about. Uh, people's temperaments and expectations. You can think that's terrible. I just know myself and you need to know yourself. And that can be a bone of contention in relationships. Unless you can talk it through and do the work necessary to understand each other. The difficult people in our lives represent opportunities for the fruit of the spirit to grow and develop in us. And we all know what Galatians 5.22 tells us, and the fruit of the Spirit is oh, just a second here. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith gentleness and self-control um those are the things that our difficult relationships should be developing in us but if we're seeing if th then that's found in galatians 5 and if we go up a couple verses above the fruit of the spirit we see the acts of the flesh so if you're feeling any of these things in your relationship I encourage you to talk to the Lord about it. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfishness, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgy and the likes. If you're feeling any of those things in some of your relationships, that's an area you, when you're dealing with people, that's an area where we need to ask the Lord to change our heart and help us to grow in the fruit of the spirit in this specific relationship. And that's where we're going to end for today. Um, I will give you a couple minutes here to ask me any questions or any thoughts. I'll tell you in the next sessions, in our next sessions, and I think everybody got the dates. If you didn't just, you know, put it in the chat or text me or email me and I will send you the dates for the rest of the year. But in these upcoming sessions, we're gonna examine each of these 15 relationship styles. We're gonna talk about the traits, how you'll know if you're dealing with a wet blanket or steamroller. We're gonna discuss the most common reasons why they do these things. Then we're gonna examine ourselves to discern whether we have any of these traits operating in us. And this step is important because once we take some time to reflect on our own imperfections, then we tend to become a little more patient and compassionate toward others. And finally, we'll look at some simple strategies and biblical principles for establishing healthy boundaries with these different folks. The, the interesting thing is I'm going to talk very practically and I would say kind of somewhat shallowly about these issues. But for anybody that wants to get in the deep spiritual things, there is a spirit behind all these behaviors. And I don't care how many Bible verses the person quotes to me or what position they hold in the church. If they are repeatedly demonstrating these behaviors, I don't know that I'm dealing with a believer. Because they are choosing willful disobedience. Or 
they have and in that disobedience they have opened the door to let satan get a hook in there as we deal with these things and these behaviors and we grow in the fruit of the spirit satan's hooks get removed from our soul and we get healing and that's how we become more christ-like and we're being transformed in our mind so we don't ever want to forget that there's a spiritual underpinning behind all of these behaviors and people will say well it's just our it's just a choice they're making it's not demonic nancy it's just a choice i agree i can make a bad choice i could say something very rude to one of you today and i just let my mouth go but then if i have the fruit of the spirit operating hopefully that i'm going to feel convicted and ask the lord to forgive me and ask you to forgive me but if I continue to do that, and I know what scripture says about that, that's willful disobedience and rebellion. And that gives Satan a hook. There are a lot of marriages that fall into this that are tricky. But the fact is, we chose to marry our spouses and we made a covenant before God. And in most cases, I think with the people that are present, we understand the spiritual realm enough to know that there is definitely uh, a spirit behind these things. And the more we move toward God and want to walk in holiness and righteousness and deal with things, that spirit's going to manifest more and more in our house, that opposing spirit. It's a fact and the way you overcome it is you express love and expressing love or the fruit of the spirit only all it does is it infuriates that thing <laughs> so it can actually make it worse sometimes um it's tricky when it's our spouse but there's a covenant there and our only option is divorce that's why i tell people god allows divorce in certain situations you have to know when you're released you have to know that you've done everything before god and man and sought godly counsel um and sometimes people are released but if you've not been released you know paul talked about the thorn in the flesh and three times he asked god to deliver him from it and god said my grace is more than sufficient for you you're good 